Hi, uh, thanks everyone for your patience. So we're here, we've got an, well, I've got less than an hour and a half to talk about art science collaborations. I'm going to talk just a little bit to kind of introduce the session. And then primarily the four of us are all going to be kind of having a bit of a chat because we have different experiences of working with the art science divide and also for any of you to ask whatever questions you might have. I really want people to come out of this having learned a bit more about what these collaborations can look like and ask any questions you might want to that will help you uh, in your collaborations in the future if that's kind of the route you decide to go down. So a few kind of things to say at the beginning. Um, this session is funded under uh, CD, so no thanks for funding for that. It's also funded a training school that happened a couple of weeks ago on art science collaborations. And I'm going to join on some of uh, the outcomes of that in, uh, in this little intro piece. Um, so, excellent. Um, so the aim, as I said for today, is to learn a bit about what's it all about. So, what, what are art science collaborations? What do they look like? Who do they involve? What are their kind of outcomes? And from the experience of us four who have done them, to try and give you a bit of experience of what, what they feel like, what they look like, and what we get from them. Certainly, when I was starting out, it was a big unknown to me what, what, this, what any of it meant, what it was going to be like working with artists. And I think if we can demystify that a bit today, then I think that's going to be a great benefit for all of us. So one of the things that came out of um, the training school was an understanding that art science collaborations kind of no two are the same. And I think us as researchers typically think about an artistic collaboration as an extension of public engagement. So it's, a, it's a, another tool for communicating our research results to a different wide, perhaps wider audience. But that's really only one of the ways in which art can be used. That's kind of art as, as public engagement. But art can also be as a convener. So you can use art as a way to bring people together to discuss a topic. We use as a bridge builder. So if you have a topic that's contentious and you have different stakeholders disagreeing, argumenting over a particular issue, then art can be a kind of middle ground where people can meet, and share ideas and opinions in a kind of neutral space. Um, art can be illustrative. So for example, you know, we do a lot of um, visual abstracts now for papers. Right? And, a lot of those are quite boring, um, but some people are getting artists involved in creating those visual abstracts can be really quite striking, um, but illustrating scientific. And it can also be, and this was very new to me, a research method in its own right. So you know, one of your methods in your science study could be to use art to get qualitative or quantitative data that's directly answering your research question. Um, that's not something I, I'd really thought of, but definitely something I'll be thinking about more in the future. Uh, we also ask the participants who remain in that early career or researchers and PhD students what their anxieties were. So these were all, all uh, environmental scientists. What their anxieties were about working with artists. And I just picked kind of some of the common themes. So what are the motivations of, of artists? So I think we understand our motivations quite well, but I don't think we understand what an artist would like to get out of an art science collaboration. <coughs> if you decide it's something you want to do, how do you go about starting that collaboration? There's no like yellow pages where you just go and sort of find the find right. So how, how do you start that collaboration? Will it help communicate my research? And I think uh, if you go down this route, you know, your institutional um, attitude towards art science collaboration that would be highly variable from one institution to another. And one of the hurdles you might have to jump is convincing people in your organization that art science collaborations will help uh, in your research. Um, how we fund it? So, you know, we don't have traditional funding routes for funding sort of things. How do we do that? And is it worth it for my science? Uh, will it directly benefit my students? Again, that can be useful. 
five weeks or getting funding or getting time of some implementation to do. And hopefully we can answer some of these through the house prior to. So we have Slido again for this session. Um, I will try and bring that up and check that. We're also quite a small room and quite a friendly bunch of other things. If you want to just ask questions as we go, pop up your hands and you can ask a question. So without further ado, I want to get into a conversation with our artists and scientists panel. And I'm going to do a bit of one-to-one, -one, learn about some of the art they've been involved with in the past. And then we'll have a more open kind of discussion session. So I'm going to start with you, Ben. I want to introduce a bit your work, uh, first of all, and then we'll come on to uh, the collaboration that you're involved with. Okay, um, so this specific work um, that we're going to be discussing today was part of my PhD. Um, and I was doing acoustic recordings in the Costa Rican forests and um, down on the Eos Peninsula. And I had sort of a um, with quite a large area to cover, and I had 400 audio recorders recording in different habitats, distances to, to roads, to towns, um, and the idea was to, twofold, um, was to understand a, a bit about the primates there and a bit about why the distribution was limited, um, which was due to things like palm oil plantations and tea plantations, roads, hunting, illegal logging. Um, and then the other side of it was to understand how are the how are the environments differing between these different habitats that we're looking at? Um, so there was a lot of palm oil plantations and tea plantations in the area, and there was a big claim from the palm oil companies there that they had very biodiverse um, plantations. Um, so we were looking at using sounds. We were actually looking at how biodiverse are these plantations compared to old growth and, and secondary native forests. Um, and so we actually found that there was a, not very much biodiversity in, in these plantations, as you can imagine. And uh, what I wanted to do is, instead of just communicating that in a way of words, okay, there's not much biodiversity, or there's a 70% loss in biodiversity, we were trying to use the audio recordings um, to, to show um, this loss. Because what we could do is... In the um, in the power in the native forest, there was this just chorus of sounds, and there was just so much sound going on. And you could tell it was from so many different animals. And then when you went to these palm oil plantations and tea plantations, it was just deadly silent. All you could hear was a few crickets in the background. And so what I wanted to do was use these sounds to communicate the message of the research that destroying native forests destroys all this biodiversity because we hear it on the news all the time. Um, but it was really putting that into context for people. Um, so I worked with uh, a group of artists called um, Super Collider, and we produced this, uh, still don't really know what to call it, an audio visual experience, uh, where we took eight, eight minute chunks of the sounds and we moved from an old growth uh, forest to a plantation, to an old growth forest, so people could really hear the sound sort of increasing and dropping. And then we use AI to match um, seven or eight different species to different colors. So the idea is that all these different colored um, bubbles that are popping up on the screen, each bubble is a sound. And because there was thousands of species, we couldn't do it for every species. So the white colors are all regenerative sounds. And then the other colors are all related to um, individual species. And we made like, a color key um, to this as well. So it's a 40 minute long piece. Um, that we produced together, and we've also made five and ten minute versions because we realized uh, people's attention span was a lot less than 40 minutes. <laughs> How did you come to make that collaboration? Um, so I had the idea and wanted to do it, and um, I went, went to, I was at Imperial College doing my PhD, um, and I went to the, we have a specific public engagement department, um, and I said, this is what I want to do, can you, is there any way you can help me? And they, because we have, Imperial College have the great exhibition, Road Festival, it's a big festival they do every year. So they do have a lot of connections with um, artists and designers. And so they liked the idea, they wanted to fund it. Um, and so they use their artistic, net, they use their network of artists and designers to pitch, to, to find the right designer and artist to do this. 
And how did you think your science benefited from, from it? Um, not so, maybe not the science has benefited, but the, the message has been spread much further and wider. There's no, there's not, there wasn't really, you could write a blog, and I wrote a blog, and I wrote a few articles, and I was interviewed by a few people um, within, within Imperial about the research because they found it interesting. But then other than a blog that somebody might read, so what's, the, what's the next step? An, or a paper. <laughs> you write a paper and barely anyone reads mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think in terms of the, the reach of the message and the reach of the, the research that I did, I can't even count the number of exhibitions I've done already. Like lots of different exhibitions. Um, next year this will be at Glastonbury. Um, so I've done different festivals around Costa Rica. I've had this international museum in Costa Rica. None of these places would would want a blog. <laughs> um, so I think you can you can reach thousands of people in many different ways. I think for me the main thing is that people will talk about this. People don't talk about and remember facts and figures and they're not so interesting. Whereas this, if they see it and they like it, they might go and talk about it. And they're not necessarily talking about the message, they might be talking about the art, but then the message gets carried through. So so yeah, I think for impact. Yeah. It's interesting that you say you've had it in so many places, so you think it has a really broad appeal across the uh, general public? Yeah, for this especially, um, especially because I did this around the time of COVID, um, so there was a lot of focus around people not being out in nature, and so what we did is we produced a few shorter versions of this, because people don't always want to be bombarded by the scientific mm -hmm. message. Sometimes you don't want to say, okay, look at how terrible things are, <laughs> but we had like little short versions which were just used as mental health tools for people. So they could just sit and listen to nature during lockdown. Um, and I think as well, I haven't really pushed this out too far yet because I haven't had time. Um, but I'd like to do some things around this with mental health. I think it could be a really good mental health tool. Um, and what was the other question? The answer the question. That answers the question, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of about, yeah, it's like it's a kind of medium that you found like it's really good for the wide range. Yeah, yeah, for Beyond. kids as well. Like kids love it, the colours and the sounds and, yeah. and adults love it and people love it for the message that it sends, but also just for the fact that wow, look how amazing biodiversity is. Not necessarily look how we're destroying it, but to show people the other side to just spread a positive message instead of the, the negative side. Yeah, I like that the soundscape's just you immediately embedded in a place when you can hear the sounds mm -hmm. and that kind of loss of biodiversity is so apparent when you move from one to another and it doesn't require any kind of expertise mm -hmm. to realise yeah less sounds and less biodiversity. I encourage people to watch it. It looks better on my screen. I encourage you to go online and check this out. Maybe I can tweet the link out. Mm -hmm. Yeah there's a there's a link to this and um, there's a little key where the link to it has a little colour key so you can see the different what the different colours mean and what they match to. So you said it's going to Gastonbury next year? Yep. Are you going to, are you checking in, you, you've got uh, an appetite for more artistic engagements, you've got anything in the pipeline? Um, so I have the hot long distance hot colour spectrums, oh, yeah. um, which we were talking about this morning. So it's another, uh, people know, probably know what spectrograms are, it's a pictorial representation of sound. And um, it's sort of a new thing that you can do right now. And you can take a full 24 hours of spectrograms of sound recordings and you can compress them into, I don't know if we have any examples. Um, and we can compress them into um, like one, one image. And it just, the first time I saw this, it wasn't supposed to be artistic. Sorry. Um, it's supposed to be a scientific tool for us to visualize the different sounds. Um, but the minute I saw it, I thought, wow, this is art. And so I've been making um, record 24 hour recordings in lots of different environments. And then I'm going to be using these as well. To I've used them in the past to communicate again the loss of nature, because in these spectrograms, you can have a black space where there's nothing, or like just one line where there's a line of crickets. And then when you're in these amazing ecosystems, there's just colors and lines, and it's just really, really beautiful. Um, so it can be used as that communication tool again, but also, um, yeah, I'd like to, to sell some of this artwork, and, but also I have an idea to 
you get some artists on board to draw these images live at, at different events. And that's one of the things I'll probably be doing at Glastonbury as well. Live drawers and soundscapes. <laughs> awesome. Great, yeah, free to it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bring it back to nice. Do you next, Laura? Or if you give us a bit of an introduction to who you are and uh, uh, what you've done in the past, and bring out your stories. So, my background is actually design, and I've spent about 20, 20 years off and on uh, working across various different projects in design, um, including uh, data projects and strategy projects, and basically. Um, yeah, also working with a lot of scientists over the years. So my first job was actually, when I was quite a young, young wee lassie, was um, working in a biotechnology company, helping create um, a kind of experience for people getting paternity tests. And also using that same kind of techno scientific technology uh, as a way to, um, which could be used of the genetics of DNA barcodes to then create a product an artistic range for people to kind of display their, their DNA barcode on their walls or on ties or whatever. So that was my kind of first foray into, um, I guess, design and science. Um, but more recently, I've actually, uh, I've literally been this week in two days time, I'm going to be graduating from an MA in RT science from Central St. Martins. And um, so my more recent work has been kind of thinking about um, human connection and also nature connection. So this is actually a project that I, um, I did with, a, with an organisation called Gorilla Science, uh, which is based in London. And it was a project that I was looking at at the time, which was part of my art practice, um, which happened to align with what they were doing. Um, and they, they had a collaboration going with um, a social psychologist and a neuroscientist, just specifically looking at attraction and I was also doing a project that was essentially around human connection in, in the kind of the, the wild west of the, the dating scene. Um, so as part of this, my project, um, and this is something that I think maybe it's worthwhile looking at later, um, is thinking about how, because it took me ages to find collaborators. Like I really wanted to collaborate with, collaborate with some scientists. And I sent probably about 50 emails over the course of a, a week um, to, you know, researching different <laughs> and doing stuff interesting with the heart or with attraction or da 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 da, da. And this was, a, I think I've got two replies and this was the only one that came, came into anything. So this was an event that we ran um, with a social psychologist and a neuroscientist and kind of collaborating together and really kind of um, inviting people to a space in London one night with some few cocktails and looking at the science of attraction and kind of collecting data from that and I always like to think about that as emotional data so thinking about how is it that you can kind of take something that's quite qualitative or quite um, visceral or quite um, it's it sometimes can feel quite hard to the individual you know if you're going through a heartbreak or um, if you're in love for the first time but it's really hard to quantify that so how can we kind of explore that in different ways um, and so I was kind of looking at that for a little while and that led on to a few other projects around human connection and then that led into the project I've been doing more recently which is um, which is this project so this is one one of the art pieces which is called Next of Kin and this piece is is kind of under a concept that I'm creating called the ritual library and so I basically have two rituals underneath this kind of ritual library currently and um, one is inspired by trees and one is inspired by moss. And basically they are, they think I've created them to kind of use moss and tree, um, trees as a kind of a way into different ways of thinking about time and our legacy on the planet. And specifically I've created, currently I've created kind of a, a system of kind of ritual artifacts, let's call them, um, that basically help, um, help people come together 
and help people think together in a group as a way of um, as what they can do as a kind of a collective to uh, to influence or kind of uh, impact positively on the future of the planet. And um, specifically, the, the two rituals that I have created are around the welcoming a new human child into the world. So I've just chosen that because I'm a, I'm a re recent mother, um, but it, I, also because it's a point at which uh, us as human beings are primed to really be thinking about the future. And so kind of taking this sort of understanding of psychology and some of the social sciences that sort of sit around kind of rituals, and creating a sort of a series of artifacts and objects and testing those out just specifically around this kind of one moment in time has been really interesting. And, um, and also I think the other, the other element to this is that although my work is probably predominantly social science based, um, there are other elements of science that are drawn into it. So um, I was in the laboratory at um, Central St. Martin's kind of looking at tree structures and under the microscope and kind of really trying to explore that. I've been um, uh, looking at materials at this point in the Anthropocene and um, I've been <laughs> taking resin from trees and looking at that under the microscope and thinking actually how can we kind of turn these, these sort of beautiful um, materials that are kind of very present from today and turn those into something that could be kind of ritualistic. Um, and also taking inspiration from the kind of, you know, looking at the London microscope and looking at the structures of it. So there's various different elements where science comes into it. Um, and yeah, I've kind of been just playing around with a lot of those different areas and having lots of amazing conversations. And yeah, basically pro doing various different prototypes to see how people respond to them. Wow, that's amazing. And really interesting to hear that there's a master's course in this kind of art science. So yeah. Is that is that course mainly around like science as integration or does it cover this kind of collaboration work as well? Um so I think it's that's a really good question. And so the one the course that I did is at, at Central St. Martin's, which is primarily an art-based institution. And um so they don't they don't currently have kind of um, hard and fast links with like the likes of Imperial, say, mm -hmm. or um, other kind of science-based institutions, like as a as a formal collaboration. Um, what they do have is kind of collaborate collaborative opportunities with various different organisations, but that's kind of I guess it tends to be more as and when. Yeah. Um, uh, what has evolved in the course is that since it was set up ten years ago, twelve years ago, I think it was. Um, that there is now a laboratory at uh, Central St. Martin's in the King's Cross pub. Um, so you can go and grow algae in there, mycelium, cellulose, all of it. You can basically it's a, it's a hub or a focal point for material exploration. Um, and you can look at things in the microscope and there's some really knowledgeable technicians in there that are basically just geeky about everything. Um, and also, so there's probably like three courses that sit with a, a scientific element. So one is ours, which is the MA in Art and Science, and then there's Material Futures, and then there's um, MA in Biodesign. Mm -hmm. So each of those course, and then there's fashion and textiles, and you know some of those will kind of look at, you know, going, some people from those courses will ask for access to the laboratory in order to kind of grow cellulose for making textiles, or, you know, mycelium for creating a jacket or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's definitely crossing, you know, just the fact that there's a laboratory there, which I think has been there about five years, three, four, five years. Yeah. It's relatively new. So they, us as scientists, might want to approach an institution like that um, to see if there's some collaboration. I guess through your masters, you were doing projects which could have involved yeah. scientists. Yeah. The other thing I want to pick up on was um, this work you were talking about. You're using it to kind of bring people together mm -hmm. and that kind of a bit that works out how artists convener mm -hmm. um, element. So I wonder if you've got any any feedback from people who have taken part in in these rituals. Yeah. Uh, and how how they kind of responded to it. Yeah. So with this one in particular, so there's there's also if you move on to the next slide, please. So this is a kind of like um some of the earlier prototypes of um what is called mossy adventures. And I've tested this in um, two uh, gallery settings and also a couple of other, um, through a, a couple of different workshops. 
Um, but the previous slide I've actually tested, so I haven't tested this with parents yet, but the previous um, slide I have tested with some parents. So I've done six, um, six testing. And it's been really interesting. Obviously, it's quite qualitative at the moment, but and I'm kind of collecting that emotional data in a way. Um, and so it's been, I've just been seeing each version as a prototype, testing it, getting the feedback. So in, in that sense, the process, I guess, is sort of fairly akin to a scientific process. Um, and taking that, you know, into the kind of, I don't know, let's say a laboratory of my mind and then evolving that. Um, and the reaction, so actually um, Clara May here, um, so she's from one of the mums groups that I'm part of, and I asked if people wanted to come and just basically be guinea, pig, guinea pigs and haul this massive canvas down to the park and a load of other things and looks kind of a bit weird. <laughs> um, but she was really, really, you know, I mean, actually, the reaction has been quite emotional because the people when the so the idea is that you kind of stand, you get invited onto the canvas you walk through into the centre. So the centre of the tree is called the Heartwood tree. And then there's a kind of a, a ritual which is based around um, kind of a, using trees as a metaphor for life, growth, death, um, and also the kind of the scars that we bear through, through our experience. But also that you can metaphorically kind of walk through the future. So if the centre of the tree here is the present, and the idea is that she would be holding her child or this ceremonial doll that's on the, the prototype on the bottom right hand corner. And then there's a ritual for her kind of walking through the tree rings. So each 30 or 25 tree rings is akin to one generation. And by the time she's got to the edge of the tree ring, it's akin to work, walking through kind of, let's say, five to six, seven generations of time. So thinking about her child that she recently had, in a kind of a future context of what will he be like when, you know, one generation, I 25, 30 years, or when he's 60 or 50, or when he's 75, and, you know, when he's 100, and maybe, maybe if he's had kids, and, you know, maybe there's future generations. And so I think what that has allowed is that kind of imagining, imagineering of the future of like what, not what could the world be like, but what would she like the world to be like for her son? And, you know, definitely there's been quite a lot of quite emotional reactions, like visualising her child at 100 when she's not there, like, you know, well into the next century. It's quite emotional experience, but it's trying to, I've really tried hard to kind of find that balance between doing it in quite a gentle way and in a way that's like loving and positive and thinking, you know, well, actually then self-reflecting and thinking, well, what the legacy um, that we're leaving, we in the circle that's around the canvas, if this was a full-on ceremony, that we as a collective, as, a, um, as a, a group of people, what's the legacy that we're leaving for this child? So it's, it's quite subtle, but it's also, yeah, yeah, I've definitely had some really good feedback from it. And I think like, we probably shy away from emotion, I think, but as, as scientists, and obviously as often going to be an emotive response to our science and that would be a really great way to kind of explore that kind of emotional side. I think just just one final thing on that. I think that's it's that's a really important point as an artist or anybody working in that kind of thing is to really be um mindful of the ethics of that. Um because I've done it before where honestly I, I did it wrong and I, and I had you know, someone that was really, really emotional and it, it wasn't a good thing. So I think I learned from that. Um, and I'm really mindful now that like, even if something is happy tears or positive or, you know, that you've got to kind of, as if you're creating these experiences to hold the brain framing for that and to make sure that there's a there's kind of a, a duty of care in a way because of, the, yeah, it's just really important. Yeah, thanks. We're going to step outside the room for a moment. Thank you. I'm uh, Gordon Blair. I'm a professor and head of environmental digital strategy at UKCH. So I do work at the interface of digital and environment. You're a really strong advocate for artists to work in teams alongside scientists and, and analysts um, as part of environmental research. So I'm wondering, what was it that brought you around to this way of thinking 
what what spurred you on to include artists in research teams? I always include artists in research teams now, and I think the reason for this is partly because artists are able to hit the heart, whereas scientists hit the head. And I initially mm -hmm. thought it was a way of expressing things in different <clears throat> ways to an audience, but I actually feel it's a way of bringing people in. You know, it embraces people and they become more involved in the research. So over time, it's become quite a fundamental part of my research methodology. Great. So it really does shape the way the research happens and, and the dialogues in the room. Yeah, absolutely. That was uh, something that emerged over time. It's not something I expected at the outset, but it's a very strong facet of working with, it, with the artists that they bring an extra dimension to the dialogue. <clears throat> what, what's a top tip? that you would give to a scientist who would like to begin working with artists? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the slightly longer version of that is that if you really invest time in that relationship, you get value back in abundance, but you have to spend the time getting to know each other. And you know, as we're working across disciplines, how different disciplines approach the research process. So you're super positive, um, but I imagine that um, working with artists isn't always 100% um, successful or, or brilliant. Uh, I might be wrong, um, but are there any pitfalls or watch points that you could share from your experience? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's necessarily working with artists that have pitfalls. I think working in a cross-disciplinary manner has pitfalls because sometimes it just doesn't lead anywhere. I've actually had more positive experiences and found easier working with artists than sometimes working with disciplines that are closer. <laughs> just because they bring that je ne sais quoi into the collaboration, they bring that surprise element and that's always positive. And so what's the impact for you of that? What what does being surprised do for you? I think as a researcher, you live off surprise. You know, too often you just go along in a linear manner, then suddenly you get pushed into a domain you didn't expect to be in. I mean, as a researcher, that's an exciting place to be. It's where you, you want to be out of your comfort zone and looking at problems in a different way. There's only win to that. So we will have been touching a lot on the idea of collaboration. And it's a word that's that's used quite a lot. What do <clears> you <throat> either understand that to mean or how how does that play out in your work? What does collaboration look like? Well, I think these days there's only collaboration. You know, the kind of problems we're looking at in the natural environment involves collaboration between you know different kinds of scientists data scientists computer scientists creative people social social scientists you need all of these elements in the room to make any progress at all given the magnitude of the problems and the many dimensions problems have these days it's the only way of doing things there's no other research if you had been in the room um and a question that I haven't asked you, what what might you want to to share with people who are listening, who are on different different levels of their journey of bringing science and arts together? Well, I would be incredibly positive about the event. I would be telling you to make the most of the opportunity, go for it, embrace the unknown and just have great fun uh, working with people from different disciplines and producing some fantastic creative outputs. Gordon's always fantastically eloquent. Uh, that he can be with us yesterday, but thanks to him and to Harriet for putting that, that little video together. Um, Gordon's obviously doing this, he's well, I mean, obviously he's been doing this for quite a long time. So I think hearing him you know, speak so wonderfully about it and, and uh, he really speaks volumes um, for me at least. So um, I want to present a little bit of my own work. So um, I have been involved in uh, art science collaboration with Tom, which you're going to hear more about in a moment. But um, I thought I'd use my little slot to talk about a little bit of 
creative work I did myself. I'm not sure I would stretch to say it is art, but um, a creative way to um, describe my research. Anyway, this was this was this one was produced as a part of the art uh, science hackathon that we had as part of this conference last year, um, and. I was trying to use it to communicate the uncertainty around species trends data. So a lot of the data I work with is um, collected by citizen scientists, which you heard a bit about this morning. And we use that citizen science data to understand how species are changing over time. So species are declining, which species are increasing, and the uncertainties with those estimates. So on this bit of wood, you've got engravings of species names. Some of the species names are really well engraved. Those ones where we know we have high confidence about their trend, and some species names are almost illegible because they're all broken up. And those ones where we have the least certainty about their trends. And then this picture is sort of fractured and of unknown size because these species are only a subset of all species. These are just the species we monitor, which are the bees and butterflies, but you know the fungi and the fungus gnats and things aren't monitored, so we don't really know how big this unknown picture even is. Um, and this was all, all done using a, a laser cutter, which is kind of a kind of hobby, hobby project that I have. Um, another one that I created was looking, kind of exploring um, data and structuring data and the value that that gives us as researchers. So you can think of this as like a pile of data. So when we collect data, we have a pile of data, but then we organize that into tables and data frames or arrays or tenses or whatever. And that, in so doing, gives it structure which we can then tell stories from. So I structured those little black squares, which represent data points, into a, a data cube. And a data cube is something we talk quite a lot about in my research. So it's wildlife species observations. And we arrange those observations uh, according to three axes, species, location, and time. So what was seen, where, and when. And when you look at it from different angles, it tells different stories. So I won't go through it now, but you can kind of look at it later. But if you look at it from, from one angle, you can see that some species are only found in a limited number of habitats. They're the habitat specialists. When you turn it and look at another angle, you can see that those habitat specialists are all declining to the, the story reference. And when you look at it from another angle, you can see that there are more record, there's more data points now than there were 20 years ago. And again, that's a feature of citizen science recording is just more as time goes on. So through that kind of one object, I was able to take that data and, and talk to you about. And this is, this is a concept we talk quite a lot about in this area of science, but kind of making it physical, I thought was quite a nice way to kind of explain it. So I've taken this to various conferences and workshops and stuff. Uh, don't drop it, it's a little bit. <laughs> it has been dropped before. <laughs> and uh, yeah, people seem to enjoy looking at it. So I guess my experience here, kind of, my toes into kind of more artistic uh, engagement or communication. I found that um, people seem to respond more strongly to these sorts of communication than now traditional forms. So, you know, when I finish, you know, when people pick that up, they're like, oh, that's heavy, and they want to look at it and they want to turn it around. And I didn't bring the picture because it's too big to fit in my suitcase. So, if people want to feel it and touch it and hold it and feel its weight and look at it from different angles, and they want to hear about how it was created and the stories behind that. And um, you yeah, don't necessarily get those same results to a scientific poster or a paper. Um, so for me, it's been a really great way to elicit more uh, visceral uh, response. Um, and it's also just a wonderful, I like spending time in the workshop making mm -hmm. creative things. And so it's a way to kind of move those creative muscles and get different parts of your brain firing up. I think that all benefits the science as well, kind of thinking in that, in that more creative way. Mm -hmm. My little two cents. So I'm going to come over to Tom, but we're going to do a little bit of an intro to Peter Rowling talking about. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's I am a data set. Maybe I am more than a data set. I am a data set dreaming. I dream this figment, a loving heat trap of glass. Are scientists managing? Did you think data and algorithms are free from influence? 
The world is a tangle. It is a briar bush of the measurable, the data, and its poetic weight. Yeah, I like to look at terror as Lord picked this up. Um, do I just uh, press down and like you know, all right, and it should go to the next slide. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Hello, I'm Thomas, I'm a poet. Um, I created this artwork with Brian Benj Abbott, who's in New York at the moment, so she can't be here today. Um, but it was very much a collaboration with Tom and also Michael from UK CEH. So, this is what happens. You can picture yourself, but it hopefully helps you. Um, you step into a wilderness. Uh, it could be in a wood. This was in Twickenham in December. We did it a month or so ago in York in um, a kind of wood and meadow area. You step into the wilderness, somewhere overgrown, and you encounter these caskets. Um, the caskets, some people see them as moth traps. Some people uh, see them as uh, tiny Victorian greenhouses. Some people with a more gothic bent see them as tiny coffins. So you can, you can see them however you want, but you encounter them. They're painted beautifully and they flicker and they glow and they pulsate with light. And the light um, mirrors the patterns of the light in the data center where the UK's butterfly and moth data set is held. So you wander the woods and you come across six of these, you kind of explore, they're, they're in no set places. And as you're doing that, you are listening to, you have the headphones on and listen to an 18 minute audio. You just heard some extracts from that audio. And the audio, is the butterfly and moth data set having her first ever dream. So slowly approaching a kind of uh, consciousness. And she's wondering about how she touches the world. And there was a little line that you, you heard an extract of it uh, just there, which I am going to read to you, that is absolutely key to, to the data sets uh, users. <coughs> Did you think data and algorithms are free from influence? Do you think the reduction of the messy natural to an organized mathematics cleanses the subjective from the objective? The world is a tangle. It is a briar bush of the measurable, the data, and its poetic weight. And that's absolutely key to this piece. Uh, science and arts, which is what we're obviously talking about today, the quantifiable and the intangible, the measurable and the boundless, how those start to come together. I disagree a little bit with Gordon when he talks about head and heart. I don't think science is head and art is heart. I think uh, art is head. I also think science is heart. I, I think that is maybe the um, division which we are told, which is why sometimes we don't collaborate as well as we could. I think it's, I think actually it's about how we touch the world. So this data set is full of the data, full of the, uh, the butterfly moth data. And she is still slowly approaching ideas of how to, uh, how to touch the world. So when we were creating this, we did lots of interviews from the scientists, Brian and I talked to lots of people involved in the project. And there were two conversations that were absolutely key to the creation of this. Um, the first was with Rich, who is involved in kind of designing the maps and the website and taking the data and, and translating it. And Rich and I had a Zoom, and um, very early on in that conversation, we, had, we realized we had a shared love of John Clare. John Clare is an 18th century romantic poet. So actually, we spent a lot of our conversation talking about John Clare. Now, John Clare was not as famous as Wordsworth and Coleridge. He was kind of a peasant poet. He's almost forgotten as a poet. Um, he suffered a lot from the Enclosures Act when, his, his, when he lived in Northamptonshire. Was, um, he lost kind of his childhood roaming lands. He, he, mental breakdown. Um, his, his time is, is kind of very prescient because the right to roam aspect that the people are pushing now is very John Clare. But John Clare, as a romantic poet, is all about how do we touch the world? How do we reach out with our imagination to touch the map of the world? And then the second conversation that's very key was with Ronald Scientist, who um, had quite a, an existential question, had a moment of existential doubt, talking about is the UK butterfly and moth data, data set, is it just charting the climate? Are we just mapping loss? Is there any purpose to what we are doing? Now, I don't know about your individual projects, but I certainly know that all of us, in whatever we do, have those moments of existential doubt. What is the purpose of this? 
And certainly at dinner last night, I heard a couple of people talk about doom. I think that word was a, was 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 raised talking about their projects. That sense that actually maybe things are going really badly, and we are just charting how badly things are going. Now I don't believe that as an artist. I believe there's always hope, and I suspect that most scientists believe that there's hope that, that if you do it right. But I think it's the kind of um, the scientists and artists joining together to bring data and imagination, science and imagination together, which is where hope lies. Uh, in the work, you come across um, the, the data set, and uh, she talks about there is something it is like to be aspects of nature. So this is reference to Thomas Nagel's, there is something it is like to be a hat. This owns a paper about consciousness. So I'm just going to read three of these. There is something it is like to be a tree. I dream of growing in slow cradle time from where I watch the wars, the brambles, and the hot, quick gone explosions of bluebells and snowdrops. There is something it is like to be a moth. I dream of the buffeting of the vast, the overwhelm of the air. There is something it is like to be a butterfly. I dream of a long, bare, warm, warm, long, stretched warmth. Is this right? There is something it is like to be a block universe of soil. I dream of the secret teachings of mycelium on its sticky loop, with worm cast and microbes in it. This last boat is actually within the data center. Our data set is trying to move beyond data. Our data set is trying to imagine what it is like to be one of these aspects of nature, which of course is something that we can't do either. So it's very much a journey that our data set shares, that we share with the data set. But I also think um, what our data set is trying to do, and I hope you get an opportunity to listen to the whole piece, um, it's on the website, you can see it in your audio. Um, it's also about art and science coming together. Because as I said, I don't think it's that division between head and heart. I think it's just different ways of touching the world. So we have data, that's vital, but we also touch it with imagination. And uh, in our, um, our audio, in our data having her dream, she decides to become an artist. Um, she thinks that looks fun, uh, better than just holding data. So she comes up with artwork titles for these caskets. And of course, artwork titles must be very long and pretentious, as we all know from Damien Hurst's <laughs> career. So this is one of the titles that she comes up with, and really it's the title for the, for the whole piece. Beginning today, we will rebuild the world from all of the good that the humans everyone is having. And that to me is about what we potentially are going to do in this room, the idea of science and art coming together to learn how to touch the world. And by doing that, that's how we start to rebuild. Um, thanks, Alice. And I can speak from the science side, but you know, working with you on this was really eye-opening to think like the way that you approach the this kind of uh, story is very different to the way I feel I approach it and yet open my eyes to many different ways of doing doing it. Yeah, well, like, likewise, likewise, I mean Brian and I both absolutely the benefit that we got. Just kind of affect because we were being commissioned, but the thing that we got from working with scientists and learning about new ways of seeing the world and, and even just learning about science, you know, it's, it's so fascinating. I think that's what maybe scientists sometimes forget that, that people are fascinated by what you do. Yeah. So, for us to get that knowledge and learn about how you see the world was that's how we came up with that piece. Yeah, and it's worth highlighting the, the kind of feedback that we got from. The exhibition was really great. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. There was, there was one said that when we, we did last month, we did it in York in, in St. Nicholas's Fields in the wilderness. And on the last day, a guy who was a volunteer litter picker and he goes around to St. Nicholas's Fields and he picks up all his litter and come back and they said, Oh, we're doing the artwork. And then he went off and he went off for quite a long time. It's an 18 minute walk or 20 minutes, but he was there for kind of, you know, went away for about an hour. I thought he needed to do it. <laughs> but then he did it back. Uh, and he took it off, it was brilliant, and he, and he started talking, and he was clearly, I think, I guess a retired academic, I don't know whether he was a scientist, but he was absolutely an academic the way he was talking. And he said, um, I did it twice, the first time I did it, I tried to do it logically, so I guess this was his kind of academic, scientific training. I tried to look at, kind of, I'm looking at this casket, and I'm listening to this audio, and why is the data set saying this, and where is this dream going? I was trying to piece it together, and I got to the end of it, and I realised it hadn't worked for me. So I went back and I did it again. This time, I decided to treat it like a prayer. Just such a lovely, lovely aspect. And it's not a spiritual piece, but he decided to approach it like a prayer. I think what he meant by I decided to treat it like a prayer is just kind of let myself be washed along by the words and just take in the evening and take in what I'm experiencing. 
Um, and that as an emotional response mm. was fantastic. But it also just people being fascinated by the data that is there. And it talks obviously about loss and it has, has kind of an act to do where it absolutely talks about the sadness of scientists. I think that is quite a surprise to people. I think people are used to scientists being um, implacable and confident and talking about the science in a very calm, measured way. And yet actually the fear that scientists are not touch on this, the fear that the scientists maybe feel about some of the charting the decline, I think that's quite important to talk about. So this piece absolutely has that dark act too. It does get more hopeful. Um, but I think, I think people are really respond well to that. I think we've got one we going to hear from one other person and then we're going to open the floor. Um, I'm Hannah Collins. I'm Associate Director of Corporate Affairs at the Natural Environment Research Council, which means I'm responsible for a whole portfolio of uh, ways in which we bring the outside world into, into NERC. Um, and one of those things is uh, public engagement. So that's where we're encouraging environmental scientists and enabling environmental scientists to um, conduct engaged research where the public are an involved stakeholder in the research. What is it that you witness when artists and scientists work together and engage with research and with wider communities? I think the first thing that I witness there is just people getting their minds blown by seeing the world through other people's glasses, if you like. So I love when um, people with completely different perspectives on a problem or on a, on a challenge come together and work to understand each other's language and perspective. And I think that applies not only to artists working with scientists, but also to scientists working with communities and members of the public and also ditto artists working in that way. Anytime that that different perspective comes together, I feel like everybody has some kind of learning experience and, and seeing that is really motivating for me. And then seeing the products that that then leads to, I guess is why I get up in the morning and do this job. <laughs> What is NERC's current thinking about the inclusion of arts and scientists within interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams? So I think one of the most important things that we realise about solving environmental problems, coming up with solutions to, to the challenges that environmental science is so great at identifying, is um, that we've got to do it in partnership because you can't just understand the environmental science of a challenge. You need to understand all the perspectives in order to come to the solution. So I think that applies not only to collaborations between artists and environmental scientists, but also, you know, engineers and environmental scientists and all the whole range of stakeholders that need to be involved basically in helping us find solutions to the biggest challenges facing the planet. And um, I think that's, yeah, that's probably the key, actually. If you were to predict the future landscape of research and practice that is directed towards solving the grand challenges of our time, uh, namely climate crisis, biodiversity decline, and the underpinning inequalities uh, that come with those social, ecological, economic and environmental, what would it look like? What's the future landscape of all this sort of coming together, if you will? I think that the future landscape looks kind of collaborative, I would say. Um, so at the moment where we kind of go for those big challenges that we think are going to, you know, or those big solutions to the big challenges, um, it involves that bringing together everybody's strengths, understanding each other. So that interdisciplinary cohort with partners, with industry, with public, um, with the NGOs that need to be involved and if you can bring the best bits of everybody so everybody's best contribution and work together to understand how you build something that's kind of stronger than the sum of the parts then I think that's the absolute key to the future landscape and I think I think you see that come through sort of speaking as NERC in our in our strategy so we really talk there about achieving environmental solutions in partnership and i think those collaborations certainly are what we've identified will get us where we need to get pretty quickly actually 
in order to kind of sort out uh, the challenges that we're facing and, and come up with these solutions. Is, is there anything else you'd like to speak into the room, uh, given that these are a group of not just early career, there's some mid-career uh, scientists in the room that came from lots of different institutions. So from your perspective, working at NERC, what, what is it what is it that might um, get them fired up with the idea of working with the creative sector, with artists, if you like? Well, first of all, I want to say to them, thank you for taking this opportunity to develop their skills and their career. We absolutely kind of want to see this change in the community and support this change. So I'm delighted that this is going ahead and that people have showed up. Um, I started working on public engagement in NERC about eight years ago. That was the first time we had a public engagement strategy and a budget for it. And um, over those years, we've been making sort of steady moves towards um, building regard for engaged research as a kind of process that is in the kit bag of an environmental scientist. And I think that um, it's so interesting when you're kind of talking about engaging with people and um, bringing kind of culture and art into that engagement to make it really something that that is meaningful to people and engaging for them. I think that's, you know, a skill that we'd really love to see environmental scientists have in their kit bag. So I'm so delighted that this community of people are coming together to build that. So, you know, thank you and, and thanks for being on the journey with us. I thought it was really important to have that voice from, from NERC, from the funder, because some people begin to say, oh, this is wonderful. Funders aren't on board and acting really in it, but you know that's you know the head of an engagement project saying they think this is all wonderful and they want to see more of it. So that should give us all the um, confidence um, that, that this is something that we can safely pursue and, and funding will will follow. So this is the link for Slido. So if you want to put any questions on Slido, you can, and I will endeavour um, to bring them up on my phone. Also, if you want to stick up your hands and ask a question, then that's fine. But perhaps I'll kick it off by asking the question that someone asked to Gordon, which is now, if you have one top tip for people who are taking their first step into the space of art science and fashion, what might it be? And maybe I'll start generally with you to have a think about what your mark's <laughs> got. You have yeah. to think about what your sort of top tip would be. Um, I think it's probably not all research that we do is probably open. To the use of art. So I suppose it's thinking about your research and what's the purpose? Like what, what are you actually trying to communicate? I think is the biggest thing to think about. Um and oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um yeah, I, I think it's just have a think about your research, the parts of your research that could be open to an art science collaboration, and think about what you want to achieve and how you would visualize it. Especially when you are working with artists. The artists that I was working with did try and take things down a little bit of a different path. And I had to be quite firm with what I with what I with how I saw it being, but also give over to them a little bit. Um, but I think, yeah, it, for you being able to visualize um the and have the reasons behind it, it would be what you think. Um I think it's just don't be afraid of just starting a conversation. Um and I think within that, it's it's just probably like any project, which is like, who do you want to work with? And, you know, so there's the artist and what they might do. And for example, if somebody approaches me and it's for, I don't know, they want something that's like graffiti, you know, kind of in style or something. That's not what I can do, but I can certainly try and help them find, you know, the right kind of artist for them. So I think it's, you know, and I think most artists do have a network. So I think if you know what you want, then it just starts with a conversation. But I also think it's like, there's, there are artists that are more open to this kind of dialogue. So I think it's trying to find those kind of artists that maybe have some experience with like commercial elements. They know how to have a meeting. <laughs> they, you know, they, they're kind of open to interdisciplinary working. They're open to kind of, not being, I guess a lot of artists kind of, there isn't really a brief, there's just an evolving kind of process. Um, but in this kind of collaboration, in a way, there's sort of a brief 
um, but it's not as strict perhaps in the scientific or design group with a set outcome all the time. So I think it's just like who who do you want to work with and what's that kind of balance in terms of finding that, that kind of collaborative compromise. And you can only really do that, I think, by having a conversation. Uh, I would say ignore the idea of the audience. So I would forget the idea that you're producing something that's going to get a certain set of people or get excited about the idea. Um, imagine it's to say it was a scientific uh, it's a scientific research, excited about the idea and just follow where it goes. And trust if the idea is exciting enough and you've done it to a higher standard, the audience will want to invite them to do But it's that all, all, all projects, but certain artistic projects, fail when they are trying to run to some magic expectation of the I didn't say that to you at start that Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for the room? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I, I didn't know what to expect. I was planning to go to another session and you just kept me here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say one sentence. I, I love this idea of challenging the concept of an objective scientist or a subjective artist. We collect so much data now. We collect much more than we can understand. So the idea that we are correct or we're not biased, what we do is just silly. And people who deal with big data sets know that in practice. So I, I love that idea, the idea that we, we can explore our method in a way that we haven't done before. I don't know with working with social scientists or with artists. It's something I'm very, very happy to, to explore. I guess the question is, how do you make sure that you do not betray the science or the art? So we try to convey very complex information, not necessarily knowledge, but we try to convey very complex experiences. We come with a very a lot of packets as scientists. Okay? So how to make sure that in a collaboration, the scientist doesn't kind of oversimplify what they do or what they try to express. And at the same time, the artist respects their art and they don't, you know, create something washy-washy for somebody who says, okay, that's it. How all this doesn't become something like a box ticking exercise and it actually makes sense and it progresses in a way I just described, in a way that it makes me as a scientist reflect what I do and I try to do it better. That's one question. I have another one. It's a bit more clear, I guess. How do you how do you reply to the argument of when somebody needs to rescue themselves for something? They need science. They don't need art. We listen to these sort of arguments a lot. So when it comes to funding, the real question is who dies at the end if you want to justify your funding? How do we as a community justify those art science collaborations? When we have to compete with this type of ideas, I'm not sure. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that I believe. I think there is a lot of value in that discussion. But when you go to somebody and you ask money for it, they will say, "Okay, yeah, who dies? Nobody." But we need to do it. How do you just? The good question. I'd like to offer some comments on the second one, if that's all right. No, no, I think. I think it was kind of really illustrated by. Them saying it's about impact. Yeah. So you're like, we've got our science, but quite often where we fail to get funding or where we fail to kind of advance that science is where we haven't communicated that impact. And like, it's through these sorts of collaborations that that impact gets communicated and, you know, then bits will get funded on, you know, you're talking about all the opportunities that you've had, you know, since that that, that research would never have had if it was in a blog post or a, or a paper. Um, so, you know, I think, I think maybe like, you know, as scientists, we talk about impact, and that's been the, the main objective of our work a lot of the time, right? You don't want to do something that sits on a shelf. Like, so yeah, I think that's that's the way I'd go down approaching it. But. And I think I can follow up on that. Just, I think there's, there's only so much we can do as scientists. We can mm -hmm. tell people what the problems are, but then can we necessarily fix them? So we can tell people what the state of the climate is, what the state of the biodiversity is, but actually, a lot of a lot of what needs to be done is all based on human behavior mm -hmm. so and unless we can change that and and i think the success or failure of biodiversity loss and climate change and whether we're all still here in 100 years is all based on how we change our behaviors in reaction to the problems that we're facing yeah. and if we just put our science in a journal article and close the book and no one can even understand it how the public ever expected to change their behaviors and how we're going to change as a society unless we unless the public understands. So I think 
it's through these sorts of it's through outreach and these sorts of collaborations that you can really influence human behavior and then you'll see change i think as well it's, it's also really it's measuring impact in this space is really challenging and I know that there are some kind of methodologies for doing that for measuring the impact of art experiences for example um but it's quite it can be a really misleading activity as well because how do you measure whether somebody that's had an interaction with something goes away and actually does something or they you know or they change their mindset about something like a lot of the time these are kind of in, that people are on a journey and these are like incremental interventions and they might be like micro interventions. So I know that there's like the art world and, you know, certainly arts funding in particular. And I think it's same is true probably with some scientific funding or a lot of scientific funding as well. It's like, you know, you want, they want to know how many visitors and, and how do people feel and, and what are they going to do? And it's, it's, so while some of that can work, I think it can also disrupt the process, the creative process, because in essence, what you're doing there is you're moving to quite a specific way of designing a brief with a specific end point. And that's what artists often don't kind of deal with. So I think that's where it's like, it's finding, it's finding artists that are happy to kind of have a certain end-ish point um, maybe that aligns with their own practice or the things that they want to explore themselves. Um, but it isn't so hard, like, you know, it's, it's become like a design, I think, because like a design brief and you kind of, you know, you work towards that end. And even if it's collaborative along the way, there's an end point because that's where the funding finishes. And that's what the funders want to see. So I think it's, 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 it's actually like really intriguing to see the funder here saying actually, I support this because I think that's a really, it might be top down, but it's an important um, signifier to people wanting to have this kind of collaboration that funders are on board and maybe they're not seeking a kind of a hard final output specifically that's pre predetermined, even if it naturally evolves from the process. So I think I'm coming on both those points. On the funding side, so with the, the side project which funded the uh, our foundation Thomas, that was public engagement money from a big project. And rather than go to the local science fair, we commissioned an art project. So I think that's probably the easiest way to fund it, an impact part of a larger project. Um, and on the first point, you have to ensure that the media artists and all the scientists are sort of going back on their truth. Um, I would say that's the signal of a good collaboration. Or you know, if it doesn't, if the balance doesn't appear that way, then you're probably not in the right sort of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And you know, working with Thomas, you definitely stood your ground. You know, this, you know, and and I think we stood our ground as well. And that's that's healthy thinking that collaboration. You know your own truths, and and then we can work together really well. So I'd use them as that indicator like, where things are quite right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lovely, lovely question, isn't it? How do you not betray your your the thing that you do. Um, I think it's about ambition. I think your point about public engagement at the, at the start, I think traditionally there have been lots of public engagement projects, which are just other ways of telling the story. It's not in a paper, it's in a slightly different way. I think that if you're going to do an art project, take them seriously, you know, create something that might win the donor prize. That's the level you should be going. And at the same time, the science that's talked about, or the piece as a whole, should be getting in the popular science press or should be presented at the conference to go into it with huge, big ambition. This is going to be more. This is going to take us deeper than, than we expect. We are going to feel uncomfortable as we are doing this. And of course, you don't, don't betray it. Um, I think we've had um, just we had a conversation with um, Tom and I earlier. Um, the Data Sets Dream, um, the last showing, um, Amy Jane Beer came to us, who writes for The Guardian, who was the founder of Right to Loan. Um, so she came to it part of Christian Briney, who's a artist, experienced it. That's then started a conversation with myself and Amy. Then it's Right to Roam, we're talking about wild service. So when we trespass, how do we not just go for a nice walk? How do we also make sure that we are servicing the, the natural world? We're recording. That is a key part of the side project is absolutely part of that. So we're now having a conversation about it, right to own and recording and this strange crossover that we're not predicting. There's no way that you have to spend out of a funding form. But it's about conversations. I mean, art is essentially a conversation with the world, as is science. Yeah. Really. Um, when we come together, it's even more of a boosted conversation.
in the questions in the room. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, thank you, it's really fascinating. Um, so the direction of the conversation often in this context tends to happen for the scientists to have public engagement. So basically the visualization or the performance aspect of it. Um, just wondering in terms of pure collaboration, is there any perspective from the artist side that I want to see scientists do for them, almost in a way, the equivalent of the you know, public engagement gender for the scientists? What will be the artist's perspective for that? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel that actually that's quite well served. I think I read a lot about artists who are interested in the term phenomenon, which feels that you talk a little about this. The artists are interested in, or oh, I'm interested in. Consciousness, or I'm interested in this thing. I will reach out to scientists. I think scientists are always so open and so willing to kind of help with data. So it, it feels that that artists are perhaps confident to reach out to scientists mm -hmm. and ask for help. Maybe that confidence mm -hmm. isn't the other way because um, perhaps people think artists um, <laughs> artists, <laughs> but it doesn't happen. It's not a force, is it? It's it's it doesn't happen as much. I think sometimes that can be quite challenging. So on previous project, I think especially if you're pursuing something as an artist in your own practice that is a bit abstracted or not necessarily fitting in a box. And um, I cited the example earlier where over like a week I emailed like 50 or tried to contact 50 different people. And I've done loads of research, I sent them personal emails and I got like two replies. And Maybe that was and one thing great came from it. That's brilliant. Um, but I sometimes feel like it is, I feel like it is quite challenging actually to um, to kind of break that door down a little bit. I think it's probably a combination of timing, networks, um, you know, kind of really doing the research actually as the artist, you know, and having the skills to be able to do that um, and to be able to kind of speak, to speak the language or to at least understand it um of you know the, the kind of the, the different worlds that you're working with um and I think the other thing that I'd add to that is um for me looking to work with a scientist it's about the mindset actually mm -hmm. so it's like again it's like who do you want to work with and are they open to like having those kind of really open conversations because if if you were approaching a scientist or you know and you had an idea for the project and I just want to do this, 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 that's great. But if that doesn't work for you, then that's not going to be a true collaboration. So I think it's about that kind of the, the relational aspect of that. And that's I think where you can hit the gold and you can kind of so I think absolutely, you know, we talked about boundaries and sort of standing our grounds, but unless you can kind of find that that um unless you're enjoying working together, it's like what's the point? Um mm -hmm. You know, to, to some degree, I think, yeah, I think that open mindedness and that mindset is really important. Got one. Um, well, it's not really a question, actually, it kind of is. Um, it's just about where, where to start, really, because I think th this is, sounds great and this is something that I'd like to incorporate within my own projects, but I don't know where to start. I don't know who to talk to. And I wonder if you could help with some signpostings. It's not as if you can find you on checkatrade.com or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who you work for, though, because I think each or each organisation will maybe have public engagement departments who mm -hmm. might already have. I don't network. know if we do, we do. I yeah, I work for Wessex Water. It's a water company, okay. um, and we do have engagement department. But this is just yeah, this is very different from the kind of engagement that we do, which is all, you know, designed to particularly drive home a message, where, where I think this is, I don't know, it's more, I don't know, it feels more organic, open, natural, sort of. I suppose one thing I could say is that the research, for you to find the right collaborator, the research would be really fun. Mm. So even if it's just you giving yourself three months to go on Instagram, mm. and to be looking around, yeah. reading and immersing yourself in the art and seeing interesting things people are doing, that's going to be great. Yeah, you know, it's like this. There's so many artistic collectives out there, isn't yeah. it? I think our art, for the ones that I work with, they form collectives of artists, yeah. and then it's like a group of people. And so rather than reaching out to individuals, there's like groups of people that seem to get together to do similar things. 
Yeah, so um, interestingly, I'm part of a, an artist collective called the Wilderness Art Collective. Mm. You should check it out. And we're going to be doing an exhibition next year, I think, at the um, Royal Geographical Society. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be on water. Right. So, <laughs> so, you know, like, um, yeah. yeah, it's not fully confirmed yet, but that's in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so there's, yeah, definitely, I think artist collectives are really important and a good way of doing that. But I totally, I think, yeah, just see it as like little, little fun projects for a, mm -hmm. um, a prototype it for a bit. And yeah, sure. So I can see sort of links with, so I'm involved in like a social prescribing mm -hmm. um, project and I can definitely see, you know, the additional benefits of having from an artistic perspective as well as, um, yeah, as well as like from the scientific one. And I can see like, yeah, definitely the benefit of the crossover. I think there's also like the model of like, you know, like this corporate um, kind of artist programs, you know, you could just run a kind of a short prototype for that or, yeah. you know, you, there's like ways of kind of, encouraging artists to come to you and apply mm -hmm. and that sort of thing will circulate quite well on social media like me and my partner we ran a residency last year in France and we had three months to set it off and we just put it out on social media we've got like 10 applications and accepted six people and within three months we've run this residency mm -hmm. and yeah fair enough maybe we've got the networks already some of the networks already established but that was just very much a prototype we didn't know if it would work um, but yeah, there's like loads of different ways that you could go about it. I think, I think social media is a really, really good point. It sounds so simple, but if your organisation has a strategy or something, mm -hmm. to just say we are looking for this and to not trust that it has to be some sort of formalised system, mm -hmm. it's just can we just have some conversations come in, let's chat. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think artists will always, 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 artists are curious as a scientist. Mm -hmm. So two curious people coming together and having a conversation about what might be. Mm. What well, that's the stuff of life, isn't yeah. it? So I'll just do that. Once. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. That's for you, man. For me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, from a scientific perspective, something that came out of a conversation we had yesterday and it's coming out through this process too is this concept of insight. So, uh -huh. um, in science, we experiment to generate new insights and understandings of the natural environment. Yeah. Um, and we do so through doing something that will be producible, repetitive. In art, it's precisely not reproducible, it's not repetitive. It's, it's a unique piece, right? But everything that I hear in this language is this concept of insight, other ways of seeing, understanding, and generating new knowledge and understanding. So, curious from your perspective as a scientist, you've been trained classically. Experimental control, experimental. This. Yeah. How would you translate this? What seems to be underpinning this discussion of understanding and insights into into something that is useful in that space? Or yeah. Would that be possible? Yes. Okay. Like moving moving away from impact. Now. Yeah. Um, not so impact. I get. I get why you do the whole translational thing. I think there's something deeper here. Mm. Curious to see how that that would then map onto how we typically think about things, which is very purposeful, beautiful. Yeah, I think the probably all of us in this room are are training to be scientists. You think you're sort of trained any kind of a way with a kind of uh, army boot camp with sort of all your sort of subjectivity and emotions in a way sort of kicked out of you and you become with this objective um, critical mind which is so ideal for doing science which is no bias and critically design those experiments that begin to be repeatable but uh, a lot is lost in that transition in that way of thinking I think working with Thomas and Bryony and having those reflections kind of made me you, you, you can't separate Science from the history. Here's what I'm trying to challenge you is uh, we know that the scientific method has worked. It's massively worked in many ways, right? So, yeah, but what's it failed to communicate? You failed to engage. In terms of generating insight, you know, we wouldn't be here if the new method. Yeah. But I guess what I'm trying to get you to think about is can, can you adapt that method? Think of it in a different way. Let it grow so that 
these new ways of thinking and new ways of, of insights can be part of it. Definitely, I mean, like through the you know, look at the feedback from the kind of work that we did, you generate new insight from the visiting people that are experiencing the work. They have new affections, new interpretations of the research. So yeah, and I'm sure you can be much more creative and think of ways in which you can build in one of the you know, art as on that open side of art as a research method. Not something I've explored, but I'm sure there's a space there where you know art can join in, become part of the research process. Not something I've done or experienced, but it'd be wonderful to think one bit more about it. But I think what the point I was trying to make about you know, I think it is important. Uh, yeah, to kind of complete the thought I was having was that. You know, it does open up your mind to a kind of whole new condition of so it fits in with society. I think that is really important. And I'm sort of like, that influence the way you use it as well, not just on the intelligence. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I even fully got the question, to be honest. So, I guess beyond impact, how can art benefit research? Do we do research different terms if we if we start if this is a true conversation between two equals? Can you use it with decision making? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like we've got like I'm doing like these multidisciplinary the projects and it's so difficult to get a bloody decision on anything. But then why not throw it out and use art to do it for you? no one's going to agree anyway so you may as well get a consensus from an artistic perspective isn't it from, through change in human behavior though if, yeah. you are, if you are actually if you're art if, if the scientific message is communicated through the art is changing human behavior i guess that's impact but then it's oh, where i'm at how oh. you're still back in that translation yeah well, you do science here you get some findings you get some observations you get some knowledge and then we get into the space of right now we have this knowledge now we've got to let the general public know about it to run it. and that's, that's whereas i argue it's, it's deeper than that i think there is something that came up our conversations a lot was this this, this concept of stopping observation observing nature the process of observing nature we have two different ways of observing natural processes but both generate insights um and so fundamentally is there something around the fundamentals of the scientific method of hypothesis testing, experimental design, etc. There's something there that can be looked at. And then you truly are in a conversation between equals. And you're starting to, to test each other's paradigms. Yeah. So, I stop trying to use art, but art is the next big use. Art is a layer of life. And um, just allow it to be a layer of life. If you're trying to use art, you're treating art as some sort of instrument. Scientific and I don't think it's helpful. But I don't think that's a question. I think the, the argument about is there anything we can learn as scientists on our epistemological approach, on our method that can benefit from art? For example, and is there anything in the idea that I am a white male applying those statistics to this task? Is there any value in thinking my positionality? That comes from social science, but sciences. But this is the idea. The idea is that maybe we are a bit too positivist for the work we have to do now. We have to think about our methodological approach, our epistemology. Maybe. maybe I think this is more like the question you're asking. Not necessarily to go that direction, but is there anything in the method we apply that can benefit from your approach or anybody else? I think this is the, the real value. I agree. This is where I I would. Not place the discussion. This is where I would benefit really from interactions with other people from other disciplines on how I would reflect on my own work. I mean, for me, it's it's a using the term insight, and I think that that means a very different thing probably in the scientific community than it does in the artistic community than it does in the design community. And every project probably has a different perspective on what that term means. It's like, in a way, it's a young word. Um, I think what artists so I think what artists can bring is often an openness or a way of testing um, reactions and human emotions and seeing what can come that people don't even know themselves. It's more deep, deeper and perhaps more intrinsic in our human condition 
maybe back to from when we were cave people or whatever, that we don't even understand ourselves. And science can sometimes put a kind of a lens or a layer on that, but but it's 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 kind of being open to those discoveries. And like for example, with your project, the, the way that a guy said, well, actually I'm going to reframe this by praying. You would never, as the artist, have kind of wanted to manufacture that. You wouldn't have necessarily thought that that's you can never control how someone is going to interact. With but that insight, that that kind of surprise, that experimental moment, that beauty has come up from something that has been created to elicit that kind of um, human reaction. And um, and so I think for me, it's like well, what can scientists learn from artists in terms of taking what can sometimes be an applied research approach. Like I I I call my art sometimes as art as a research process with some parts of it, but not every part because if it's constantly like that then it's it loses something so i think it's it's what can you learn from each other and that's that's different in every single project i don't disagree which is what i was asking Tom. yeah because he's got a really positive note i'm afraid we've run out of time hopefully you guys hang around for a bit so if anyone's got any arms questions would be and see i think that's an thing really kind of Off with that link to one of the conference national the various things we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you.